Good morning, everybody. Or should I say, Merry Christmas to you, Hep Cats. How many people were snapping during that music? The proper thing, I don't want to correct you guys, but you're not supposed to applaud. You're supposed to snap when you get jazz like that. But. So next time you do that. Hey, my name is Pastor Scott. I'm one of the pastors here. Our teaching pastor, Pastor Matt, is in uh, the happiest place on earth, Disneyland, with his family. It's only the happiest place on earth until 1245 when it becomes nap time. And then it is not the happiest place on earth anymore until about three again. Um, anyway, you can be praying for them. This is their biannual uh, tradition, and so uh, blessings on them. Uh, we are in the third Sunday of Advent this morning, which is hope. And as I was preparing for this, I was kind of looking at how many things are adorned with those, those words, you know, joy, peace, hope, and love, that you combine. I actually went to Esty and kind of saw... You know, I have to say, how many things can I buy with that kind of stuff emblazoned on them? And there are tens of thousands of items that you can buy. Maybe you don't want to buy. I don't know. Some of those things didn't appeal to me. But it kind of illustrated for me what these words have become. And I think they've become, for much of society, just uh, trappings of Christmas, much like Christmas lights or eggnog. So I'm excited that this morning we get to talk about, about this during this particular time. Uh, before we start, how about if we pray and get our... Our day started off right. Father, we thank you for this time together. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be uh, infused to everyone in this room and that we can have a better understanding of the hope that we celebrate this morning. And I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So in the Old Testament, the verb hope refers to waiting or expectation. And we're going to be focusing on Isaiah chapter 40, starting at verse 28. If you have a, an analog Bible, and um, you're not familiar with it, if you, if you open up to about the middle, you're going to find Isaiah maybe a couple pages to the left. And it's at a time, Isaiah was written at a time when Israel was without hope, pretty much. They were living in, most of them were living in Babylon in exile. So you can imagine what a hopeless situation that might be. But we have this beautiful verse that a lot of us might be familiar with. It's very striking, the imagery that comes from it. Let's, let's read from that right now. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. What a beautiful poetic illustration about the hope of God. And again, this is written to people that are living in captivity in Babylon. But I think as Christians, we can relate a little bit to living in a society that doesn't match up with who we are right now. I think as a Christian in this society, people say that, well, our country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles, and I don't see that. It's certainly found on Judeo principles, but, but really not Christian principles. And so sometimes it feels like we can be out of sync. So if we're not careful, I think we can lose hope as well. But I wanted to start off with a video clip that illustrates this. It's obviously taken from this, this passage, and it's from uh, the Lord of the Rings series uh, that Tolkien was a Christian. He, if you haven't read the books, um, I would encourage you to do that. There's there's Christian themes throughout the series. And I give you a spoiler alert because we're showing toward the end of the third film. I was feeling bad about it this morning, but then I thought, well, the book's been out for 65 years, and the movie's been out for 15 years, and I know you're busy, it's Christmas time, but I figure you probably would have seen it already if you had that on your list. I would still encourage you to see it. It's, it's a great story. Um, I have to set this one a little bit. If you're unfamiliar with the, the books, there is this evil ring, and they have to destroy this ring because it's, it's wreaking all kinds of havoc through all the land. And so the two heroes, uh, Sam and Frodo, are charged with, with taking this ring. It can only be destroyed in one place where it was created. The bad news is that's a volcano. So they have to go into the volcano, and the whole book is just one trial after another, one danger after another, one battle after another, where they have to proceed through this. Where the clip starts is they've already destroyed the ring. They're coming out of the volcano, and they are without hope because they're stranded here, and they start lamenting that they'll never see their friends, they'll never see their home again. And that's where we take up this clip.
done. Yes, Mr. Frodo. It's over now. See the shine. The Randy Wine River. Like it. Gandalf's fireworks. The lights. The party tree. Rosy Cole dancing. Have you ever felt that hopeless? Have you ever felt like you're clinging to a rock in a lava field? I know some of your stories here. I know some of you have. You get to a point where you think, rescue's not coming. That's happened a couple times to me in my life. Once was 29 years ago. I remember exactly where I was. I was sitting on the curb in a parking lot outside of the intensive care unit of a trauma center in Mission Viejo, California, and I had best just been told to say goodbye to my wife. Because the hope of man was extinguished. The hope of medicine and science was not available to me. I wailed to God. She's here this morning, by the way. Pretty cool. Because the hope of God was available to me. And it took months, but he did answer that. But I understand what it's like to be in that place, to be beyond all human intervention. And I think that our society understands that hope is necessary as well, but they're not looking to God. They're looking other places. They understand that it's imperative that they have it. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, who's not a believer, but withstood being in a concentration camp in Nazi Germany, wrote about this. And he said, the prisoner who had lost his faith in his future, his future was doomed. With his, loss of un, with his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and became subject to mental and physical decay. Usually this happened quite suddenly in the form of a crisis the symptoms of which were familiar to the experienced camp inmate. 
Usually it began with the prisoner refusing one morning to get dressed and wash or to go out on the parade grounds. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect. He just lay there, hardly moving. If this crisis was brought about by an illness, he refused to be taken to sickbay or to do anything to help himself. He simply gave up. Our society puts their faith in human effort. It's logical. They can't do it in God. They're not worshiping God. They're going to do it in human effort. But if you go past that, you think, well, all of the problems are caused by humans. So it seems strange that they're looking to humans to solve those problems. That would be godless hope. Hope outside of God gives us violence, disunity, pain, fear. Every time, ultimately, every single time. And society is living without hope in general, and they know it. And it doesn't, it's understandable. If you watch a news program for more than two or three minutes, you're going to lose hope, right? It's a, it's a downer. Even when you look at how great we're doing in history, if you look historically, we're going pretty well, right? We're living longer. I looked, uh, 1918, the average lifespan was 36 years. It's double that today because of all the problems I had uh, with the flu and different different things going on there, right? We've come a long way. We're the wealthiest time in history. We have a lot going on, but if you talk to most people that aren't following Jesus, they don't have a lot of hope. They're just kind of trudging through life. And if you don't believe me that hope is desired by society, think back to 10 years, 10 years ago, when President Obama ran his first campaign. It was a one-word slogan. You guys remember what that was? It was hope. That's how we know that society needs hope, because you wouldn't pitch something you wouldn't pitch it, you're going to bring something to something that we already had an abundance of. People say, oh, we got plenty of hope, we don't need this. No, that resonated with the majority of people, right? That one word, hope. I think living without God, you're typically only just resolved to the situation. You're making the best of it. And you have to put your hope someplace. So where do people put it? They put it in science. They put it in discoveries. They put it in space travel. They put it in the goodness of humanity, which always sounds like a straight line to me. The goodness of humanity. Have you never read a history book? The goodness of humanity. But they're always, that's always going to fail us, ultimately. I heard Rick Warren give a talk one time, and he talked about three types of hope. I love this. The first one was wishful hope. Wishful hope is saying, I hope I win the lottery next month. It's going to be a big pot. It would change my life. It would be awesome. Now, I didn't buy a ticket because I know that the odds are about the same whether I buy a ticket or not, but that would be wishful hope, okay? The second type of hope is expectant hope. Expectant hope has a little bit more to it. So if I had a a 20-year mortgage on my house and I'm in year 18 and I have a good job and my health is good and the economy is going well, I could expect I probably are going to be able to own my house outright in a couple of years. That would be expectant hope. The last one is the hope of God, and that is certain hope. This is the beautiful one. This is the one we celebrate today. Certain hope, an example of that would be, as a follower of Jesus, if I died today, I would be with him. No doubt about it. No wishful thinking. No maybe. 1 John 13 tells us, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. There is no doubt. Another way to say that would be, God has my best interest at heart all the time. To believe that even when you're clinging to a rock in the middle of a lava field. God ultimately has my best interest at heart. Real hope is based on God's word, not emotion, not in human effort. Jeremiah 29 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Even if you're in captivity, even if you've been told that your wife's dying, even if you're in a, a, a terrible marriage, even if you are uh, in financial straits, whatever the circumstance are, God still has the best plan for you. We have this uh, catchphrase we've been using in the last year, right? Better with Jesus. Life is better with Jesus. Life is better with Jesus and every aspect of life is better with Jesus. All those things are better with Jesus because of that hope. 
Jesus equips us in such a way and intervenes for us in such a way. He doesn't take all the, all the problems away, but he enables us to flourish in those situations. When, uh, when Patty survived that, being in that coma, and we had the best brain surgeon on the West Coast, and he had to, you know, he, I don't think he, he wasn't going to see me for past a couple of days, and, you know, I was there all the time, and I said, so how come? How come she survived? He said, I don't know. I said, I do. Can I tell you about it? That's the kind of hope that he equips us with. This is not the world's hope. This is not optimism. This is the hope of God. Now, of late, people are seeking to put their hope in political movements and political figures, right? Um, there was an election that happened a few weeks ago, and half of the people were thrilled, and half of the people were bitterly disappointed. And in a couple of years, it'll probably be reversed, right? Now, it always amazes me that people get so excited and put so much hope in political movements because you, if you read any history book, those always fail. Every single time they fail. Because they're men. Men at best are only men at best, right? People are always going to disappoint us. Job 8, starting at verse 11, says, Can papyrus grow where there's no marsh? Can reeds flourish where there's no water? While yet in flower and not cut down, they wither before any other plant. Such are the paths of all who forget God. The hope of the godless shall perish. Hope in anything other than God is going to let you down. Every single time. And being without hope is being without God. I want to go back to Isaiah 40 and just kind of expound on a couple of these points that I think are, are just terrific. At verse 28 it says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? What's he saying? Don't you know anything? Don't you remember what God has done for, for you guys? Now he was talking to Israel, but he's talking to me too. How can I lose hope? I know what God redeemed me from. I know what he's capable of. How can I lose hope? The idea of forgetting what God's done for us is absurd, even in captivity, even on a rock in a lava field. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He's not bound by time or space. He's not surprised or caught off guard. Whatever, whatever storm that you're weathering, Right now, God knew about it. It's okay. He's going to get you through. Turn to him. I promise. It may not turn out exactly the way that you'd hope. He's going to get you through it. I promise. He will not grow tired or weary. He can't be worn out. He can't be overwhelmed like you and me. He's always at work. His understanding no one can fathom. Don't worry about burdening yourself not fully understanding the creator. It's a foolish exercise. You're created. You're not going to fully understand the creator. It's okay. Take comfort in that. The day that I fully understand God, I'm, I'm shaken, right? Because I, I like it that I can't fully understand him. He's so powerful. He's so beyond Scott. Thank heaven. You guys should thank heaven. Oh, I'm so glad that God's beyond Scott because what a mess that would be, right? God is, cannot be fully understood by me. And we need to take comfort in that. God is always right now, he's always right here, he's always at work, and he's always wise. He gives strength to the weary. He will sustain us, support us, and encourage us. We just need to leave it to him. He increases the power of the weak, the spiritually weak, the weak in faith. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall Again, human strength will always fail us every single time. Even at its best. But those who hope in the Lord or wait upon the Lord or wait upon the Lord's timing. We have a beautiful example of this right now. Our church planners, our missionaries to Danakit, Indonesia are the Clausens. Dan, I'm sorry, not Dan. That's his brother. Don't tell him who said that. Andrew and Amberlynn have been living in this village that you can only get to by helicopter. Very small people group that was unreached. And they had to prepare for it for years. They had to learn the language. And they had to learn the culture. And then they moved in and they built their house. And they took their young family there. And they developed relationships with them. And they lived there for five years and saw no, no fruit from their efforts. Five years living in a jungle. 
But they waited upon the Lord. They did not lose heart. They did not lose faith. They had hope. And I'm so excited to tell you that in the last few months, 17 people have come to faith in Jesus. Amen is right. Through that faithfulness. That's uh, Leon, that guy in the middle. He was one of the first ones that, that turned his back on the, on the uh, witchcraft that ran rampant through that village. So awesome that, that they demonstrated what it means to hope in the Lord, renewing their strength. By that, they were recharged, re-equipped, and refocused. Do that every day. Recharge, re-equip, refocus as we're waiting expectantly on God. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God will do the impossible. Expect nothing less. Why not? When, when science tells you one thing, don't worry about it. When the counselor tells you another thing, don't worry about it. When your bank tells you one thing, don't worry about it. God will do the impossible. He's in the impossible business. Don't limit your request to God. He's going to do it in his own time. But don't get me wrong. When Scott prays, I want what I want, and I want when I want it, right? I usually want what I want, and I want it now. I hardly ever play, God, I want this thing, and nah, take five or six months, it'll be fine, right? I want it right now. That's not good. I should wait upon the Lord, put my needs out there. He will either answer them or, uh, this is a bold statement, he will either answer them and bless me in a way that I never imagined. I prayed for years at, our, at the church that we were birthed out of, the Duval Church. I prayed for years that God would take away the debt of that building. We had a tremendous debt that was difficult for us to manage. I prayed for years that God would take that away. What I thought he was going to do is bring in a rich Microsoft guy. He didn't. We started a new church and got rid of that debt. He did it his way at his time. God will bless us, I promise you. But we must look for our hope to God, not in Babylon. We cannot have our faith. We cannot stand with our, our foot in the God boat and our foot on the dock of Babylon. We have to be all together. That's how God will use us. Our faith is exclusively in him. Doing that, having faith exclusively in Christ, by the way, makes us invincible. Invincible. Think about this. If I'm a follower of Jesus, until Jesus is finished with what he wants me to do on earth, I am immortal. What do I got to be afraid of? Think about it that way. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're here until he wants you. And that's the time to go when he wants you. Until that time, nothing to worry about. Our hope is in Jesus and the 7,000 promises that are made to us in the Bible. Hebrews 6.18 says, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. I love that expression, to hold fast. That's a nautical term, right? You hold fast. When, when there's a problem, that's a, they'll scream out, hold fast. You hold on to the line. You hold on to the rail. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. That anchor is so important for our lives, to have an anchor. You sailors know about anchors, right? When a boat gets in trouble, when there's a storm, it will seek refuge and it will drop an anchor because an anchor is going to keep that boat from drifting into danger. And that's exactly what we should do. Our anchor, our rock is on Christ. It allows us to ride out storms. Don't, don't get me wrong. Christians, we're going to have storms. Storms will come. It's okay. We got an anchor. That anchor is going to keep us from drifting into dangerous areas, right? To, to drifting into dangerous mental areas, to drifting into dangerous theological areas, to drifting into dangerous discouragement. We need not be discouraged because we have the anchor. This anchor allows us to live our lives, to do our work, to serve in our ministries with confidence and be able to focus on the task at hand, knowing that God has this. And let me tell you that lack of hope is a powerful tool of Satan. I hate that guy. It's hard for me to talk about Satan without swearing. I got to confess. I hate that guy because he lies to us. He's a big liar. He lied to Adam and Eve. He lied to Jesus. He lies all the time. And he's going to try to lie to you and me. And he's going to tell you, nope, God does not have this. God's forgotten about you. God's too busy or he's not going to deal with this thing. It's too big. It's too small. 
you're not good enough. You haven't been living the way God wants you to, and so he's ignoring you, and he's not coming. You tell him, beat it. (laughs) How's that? (laughs) That's what came to my mind first, but God took over. Beat it. (laughs) Go pound sand, Satan. Don't believe those lies. He's the prince of liars. Now, can followers of Jesus lose hope? Yep, we can. We definitely can. What are you supposed to do? Jesus tells us in Luke 18, He says that we should always pray and never lose hope. What's the antidote antidote of being hopeless? Prayer. Pray. I'm going to tell a story. So some of you know that I've been, uh, my wife and I have been building an apartment on our home for my parents to come live. And initially, I was foolish enough to try to do this myself and serve as a general contractor. Everybody gets to do one really stupid thing in their life, right? That was, well, that wasn't the first one, but it's, it was a big one. <laughs> and uh, since then, a friend of mine has rescued me and, and, is, and is getting me through this. But before that happened, I learned that uh, contractor, the, the Greek for contractor is series of constant disappointments. Right? I looked it up in the Greek, and that's what that means. Because every time somebody would come up to me, they would give me bad news. Nobody said, you know what? Everything's going great. Yep, it was perfect. Everything's going great. Oh, well, it did come in a little under budget. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, what would happen every time I would see one of the subs, they would come and tell me something bad, right? And it was just one thing after another. And I know this doesn't seem like a big thing in the, in the big scheme of things. I know there's people here suffering under cancer and marital problems and financial problems. But this just was like, became too much. And I was sitting in my office and I got a call from one of the subs. And he goes, hey, the inspector was here. And I usually met the inspector. I wasn't there that day. And I said, yeah, the inspector was here. And guess what? One of the other subs did something that is going to cost you many thousands of dollars and is going to put you many months behind. And I said, okay, well, thanks for the call. And I hung up, and I thought, man, what am I going to do? Because I'm on a really tight budget. What am I going to do? And so I did something that is not done, and I, I got the, the information from the, uh, from the building inspector and gave it to the uh, sub, and I just said, you guys work it out and get back to me. So I just changed emails and work it out. And that's not done. I, don't, I didn't read the contractor rule book, but that's what I was going to do. And then I did something that I should have done when I first got the news. I prayed. I said, God, I'm done. I mean, it had a roof on it and everything. And I said, uh, we can make this a doghouse or whatever you want to do with it, but I'm done. Right? It can be storage. What do we could put? photo albums out there. we got lots of photo albums we could start out there. I'm done. And I just turned over to God. I said, whatever you want to do, you let me know, but I'm done. And I stopped, and the phone rang. And it was the uh, building inspector, who's never called me before. And he said, yeah, I got your email. I'm a little confused. And I go, okay, what's confusing? He goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, you told this guy that this thing isn't correct, and this other thing isn't correct, and it's not going to pass code. And he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, I know you guys that are smarter than me, you would have hung up. He goes, okay, goodbye. I didn't. I said, no, no, no. What he told me you said was this, this, this. This isn't going to pass, and it's going to be expensive, and this, is, this needs to be done for, for us to go forward. And he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, okay. We're good. We're good. I said, thank you. And then I hung up, and I said, thank you. Because it was a situation, again, I know it's small, but it was a situation that I wish I would have prayed at the beginning of the morning and I waited till then, but God took over. There's no explaining that any other way. This isn't how inspectors work, by the way. <laughs> you don't call them and say, okay, forget about it. Just keep going on. I love this uh, quote that we posted on our social media. If you haven't subscribed to our social media feeds, I would encourage that. What we do is twice a week we post some kind of quotation um, that is significant to the pastors in some way. Sometimes it's scripture, sometimes it's theologians, sometimes it's atheists. But we post these things, and this was great by Max Licato. No one can pray and worry at the same time, right? No one can pray and lose hope at the same time. Why? Your, your heart can be filled with one of the two. You get to pick, pick one of the two. I pick prayer. So, so important. I love that. All right, so we're going to close by going and talking about a guy named Simeon. And we're going 700 years in the future from our passage in Isaiah. The good news is Israel is no longer living under captivity in Rome. 
The bad news is the Romans have conquered Israel. And the Romans aren't the warm and fuzzy conquerors that you might want to have as your conquerors. Rome was known for a few things, aqueducts and roads, and being the most powerful army that the world has ever known, and being pretty brutal occupiers. So you can imagine at the time that Jesus was born, it was a pretty hopeless time. Right? There wasn't a lot to put hope in. And so we pick up in Luke 2, starting at verse 25, and it says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you've prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. Now get this. So this guy, Simeon, we don't know how old he was. Tradition says he was old. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but he, the Lord told him, God said, you will not die until you see the Christ. So he goes to the temple, right? And, and Jesus was being carried in by Mary and Joseph, and they were, were doing what, what was called for in Jewish tradition. They would take their firstborn son, and they would dedicate him in the temple on the eighth day. So you can imagine, this would be kind of off-putting if you walk in with your little baby, and you're just walking in there to, to this little religious ceremony, and this guy comes running over and grabs your baby and holds him up and starts proclaiming stuff, right? Even for Mary, that must have been weird. And Mary had lots of weird stuff going on in her, her life, right? That's got to be weird. I always think about Mary, you know, the angel comes, hey, Mary, look, I'm an angel, and she'd be all freaked out. Hey, you're going to have a baby. She goes, I'm a virgin. She goes, don't worry about that. It's from God. And he's going to be the savior of all mankind. And then shepherds come and start worshiping him, right? Every single thing that Mary experienced in her life was just like, well, that's something, right? I mean, Mary must have been some strong woman. So here she has this stranger come over and just grab him because he is overcome with what he is experiencing. Why? He is holding the Christ. He is holding the hope now and forevermore. He is holding what is going to start the redemption of all peoples and all creation. He cannot be contained. He grabs this baby and starts running around the temple shouting this. Don't you guys know what's going on here? Hope is here. Not, not just their, their present circumstances going forward. Because Simeon knew that Jesus was and is and always will be the hope of the world. Simeon knew, like Paul said later, that neither life nor death nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor, nor tragedy nor being in an accident nor, nor being in a, in a horrible marriage nor being in a financial crisis nor, nor getting a terrible medical diagnosis Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everything else shrinks in comparison. Nothing is beyond his redemption. This is what we celebrate today with hope. There are two kinds of people in this room. Those that experience that hope presently in every aspect of their life and the life to come. And those that have not done yet that. Have not yet done that. And I pray that you would Take a step toward the light right now. All that hope is available to you. As soon as you choose to follow Jesus, it happens miraculously. Just as Christians, as, as, as God indwells in us in this weird supernatural way, he also op offers us hope in this weird supernatural way. When I was, uh, Patty was in the hospital for months, and when, when that happens, they assign you a social worker. Right, or they did, this is a long time ago, I don't know if they do anymore, but they did at the time, and they would just kind of check on you and see how you're doing. This social worker wants to talk to me in her office, I go in there, and, and she says, uh, I think you need to see somebody. I go, okay, who should I see? And she goes, I think you need to talk to somebody because you're in denial. And I said, what do you mean? And she goes, you don't understand the gravity of the situation. I said, I do, because she had to learn you know, how to do everything again. 
And uh, I said, I totally understand the gravity of the situation. She goes, why, not, why aren't you upset? And I go, well, I'm not happy about it, but I, I'm at peace because I have the hope of Jesus Christ. Made no sense to her. She was a woman of science and social working forms. I don't know what. <laughs> she didn't know. It wasn't available to her yet. But it's available to each and every person in this room, and I pray that you would surrender to that. And I would love to tell you all about it. You know, I get excited sometimes when I talk about this. If you haven't noticed, I'm going to be outside. And if you want to know how to, how to grasp some of that hope that's being offered to you today, I got you covered. Come out and talk to me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this gift, this gift that we celebrate every single Christmas, this gift of hope. You love us so much, God, that you made a way to redeem us and to redeem your creation. Thank you, Father, for that gift. Help us, Father, as we go through this season. And there's so many things that distract us. Wonderful things, fun things, beautiful things distract us. Help us not to forget the hope that we have in you. And Father, for those that are here this morning that don't have that hope, that have not, they're still filling it with, with, with hope that will fail them. I pray, Father, they would be led to you, to the hope that will never fail, never disappoint, and never desert. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.